Saturday night. It's Open Mind. I'm Bill Jenkins, and you're going to need one tonight. Because we probably are going to sort of brush ever so lightly so many things that have been brushed in some detail here before. But one of the finest masters of weaving these tales, and they're not just tales, but they're the results of a lot of science, a lot of research, a lot of know-how, and a lot of experience, is encoring tonight on Open Mind. He's Dr. Andrea Pahavich. He will be speaking to us on our conference line in just a moment. And one of the very first men in this world to discover Andrea Pahavich and the work that he was doing up in Ossinger, New York, and around in in the realm of psychic research and psychic phenomena and UFOs and ELF and all of those open mind things, it was a good friend of ours, Alan Vaughn. Alan, welcome to Open Mind. Good to be here, Bill. Hit the red button over there. There you go. Good Alan, to be here. Tell us a little bit about what you know of Andrea. Well, I first met Andrea back in uh, 1969 uh, in New York City. Uh, at that time, he was working on an open heart, uh, Parmione apparatus to substitute for the heart, artificial heart. Mm -hmm. And so we talked through the night there at Bellevue Hospital, and he was telling me about his explorations uh, with Arigo in Brazil, and his pursuit of UFOs, uh, some fascinating work on healing. And over the years, well, when he went to Israel, he said, I'm going to look for UFOs. Yeah. And he came back with Uri Geller and you have uh, found Uri Geller. And uh, uh, by the early uh, 70s, I was editor of Psychic Magazine, so I was able to do uh, the first story in Uri Geller and an interview, and also an interview with uh, Andre Buharaj. I felt uh, that this work was probably the most important that was going on in parapsychology. Well, yeah, you know, he once played um, sort of a mad scientist, a parapsychologist on the Perry Mason show years and years ago. And his hair is a little wild sometimes. He's, but he, was, he has the most extraordinary uh, imagination. He's a maverick in the field. But I've discovered that uh, almost every new uh, thing that comes into parapsychology, uh, Andre's there first somehow. Andre Poharic, are you for real? <laughs> You're on, Andre. Bill? Yes. Hey, Bill, good talk to you. <laughs> All right, glad. We were just talking about you. Were your ears burning? Uh, yeah, who is that talking? I didn't recognize the voice. Hi, this is Alan Vaughn, Andrea. Alan Vaughn, God bless you. Lovely to hear from you. Good to hear you, too. Oh, listen, I'm going to see you out in California when I get out there on the 18th, 19th, I hope. But we're excited about that. Well, everybody's kind of planning on you being. Well, that's terrific. I look forward to seeing you. Well, we have so many things to discuss tonight with this audience, Andre. Where would you like to start? What do you do? What's the What's the most dramatic thing that's happening? Not that everything isn't. Well, <laughs> you know, from my point of view, I'm sitting in my lab and I'm doing little things here and little things there. And I never know what's dramatic and what there might be a clunker, you know. Uh, the thing that, that's got me very excited and busy now, I've been working for a number of years on the whole problem of what I call ELF, that's extremely low frequency magnetic waves that are being used in modern warfare and that are also uh, psychoactive and that they modify behavior at a distance without the person being aware that anything is going on. And I've been so concerned about that for eight years that I determined that by hook or crook, I'm going to make a, a, some kind of a device that's going to be a personal shield for an individual so they cannot be damaged or hurt by uh, these ELF uh, waves. And well, we've certainly seen the ELF phenomenon going on uh, yeah. that's associated with the woodpecker signals and the yeah. things that we have discussed in uh, many occasions. Yeah. How does this differ from the new uh, thing that's being thrown at us from over there? That's uh, the scalar wave. Well, actually, uh, it's pretty much the same sort of thing. It's just new, new terminology. But uh, basically, Nikola Tesla invented all this in 1900 yes. and really discovered the scale of nature of these ways that the Soviets really copied from Tesla's work. And it was really due to the uh, brilliant 
detective work of our friend Tom Bearden, uh, who uh, really identified them as scalar waves. So we're talking about the same thing, different terminology. Well, uh, one seems to be more of a potential energy that is being leveled at us, where the ELF is a kinetic wave. Yes, you're quite right in that, in that in order to get a, a scalar wave to be uh, kinetic, you have to intersect two of them, set up an interference pattern, and where the interference pattern occurs is where you get your kinetic effect. But uh, we're still talking about the same basic phenomena in the... Uh, in the uh, uh, Soviet ELF transmission, for example, in order to get their uh, ELF transmitters to be effective in this so-called warfare that's going on, they usually have to use two of them, each mm -hmm. one being a scalar beam, and that way they steer where the effect is going to occur. If they want to drop it on New York, they uh, get a phase array, so-called, of two of these transmitters. They have a number of them on Soviet Union. So uh, it really isn't that big a distinction in terms of that effect. I tell you what, we're getting a little interference on a bad telephone line, Andrea. Uh-oh. What we're going to do, we're going to take a break here, and I'm going to get us to uh, try another line with you. Yeah, and we'll I'm... be right back. Okay. Good. I know that Alan is chomping at the bit to interview you again. Uh, I'd so... love to talk to Alan. Can I hang up the phone then? Yeah, you hang up, and okay. we'll get right back to you. We're okay. talking to Dr. Andrea Pohadric, along with Alan Vaughn, who's guest in studio with me tonight. Just to give you an idea, we'll be discussing the scalar wave. We'll be discussing the crystal skull, but a little different one that Nick Nessarina would talk about next week. Uh, that's the Mitchell Hedges skull. We have some other skulls we want to get into. Andrea knows a great deal about those. Our old friend, the UFO, certainly psychic phenomena. He was very instrumental in the development of the abilities of Greta Woodrow, who will be with us uh, the latter part of January. In fact, she will be in town. Oh, a lot of things. A lot of things are going to happen tonight, so stay with us. I'm Bill Jenkins. Help is Alan Vaughn. Alan tonight will be playing a different role than he usually does when he visits with us because he's now the interrogator, the inquisitor, the investigator, because we want to interrogate and investigate one of the finest interrogators and investigators in the world and those things that are so near and dear to us on Open Mind, and that is Dr. Andrea Paharic. I have uh, words of welcome to you, Andrea. From an old friend of yours, Greta Woodrow. Oh, thank you. She's a love. She is? She will, yep. be, she will be here the last week in January. Oh, that's terrific. And she said to give you her love. Yeah. And she certainly remembers that Faraday cage. <laughs> Nobody can ever forget one. <laughs> <laughs> and she is still bending spoons and shrinking metal and doing all of those wonderful and things. And healing. And certainly healing. Yeah. She will be giving a workshop on healing, showing you how to do it and uh, to bring us all here in Southern California up to date on uh, the marvelous work that she has been doing. Alan, your turn. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Alan. How you doing? Oh, great. I hear rumors now that you've got a special watch that protects people from ELF. That... Yes. Uh, do you want me to describe it quickly for you? Yeah, I'd be very okay. interested. Uh, what it is, essentially, it's a quartz type of watch and I developed a magnetic chip circuit that goes inside and satellites onto the uh, quartz oscillator circuit, and that puts out a steady beat of 8 hertz, or 8 cycles per second, a uh, magnetic wave, and it slowly builds up around the body in uh, kind of like a cocoon fashion. Mm. And we've got all kinds of uh, very hard you know, scientific experiments where we can measure the magnetic field on a person before they put the watch on, and we see a, a broad spread, a spread of frequencies because almost everything in our environment puts out some degree or other of ELF. And it turns out, uh, to explain what ELF does, we have pretty clear evidence that ELF goes directly for the nucleus of every cell and selectively activates specific portions of the DNA, we know, which is the master molecule of life that guides all of us, our uh, chemical and other activities. And so that's why it's dangerous. So the, the circuit I've developed, which incidentally I call the Tesla, T-E-S-L-A-R, in honor of Tesla, who kind of started all this about uh, 80 years ago. And uh, the, the Tesla, when you wear it, it takes a few hours to build up this field around you. 
uh, absolutely prevents any ELS from getting at the nuclei of your cells and causing a lot of uh, damage all the way from mild behavioral disturbance up to very serious diseases. Well, tell me, uh, Andrea, in your estimation, because we have been detecting here recently in the Southern California area a very strong pulse of 5 hertz yeah. in the uh, in the scalar band. Right. Uh, what does that do to the nucleus of the, uh, of the cells? That releases what are called cholinergic type of chemicals, which in turn cause depression. And uh, that effect occurs from about 5.0 hertz, about 6.66 hertz. And uh, it, it's really a very bad frequency in terms of causing really alarming states of depression as those who are sensitive. We need to point out where those 5 hertz waves are coming from, the Soviet Union, and they're being uh, done deliberately. Yeah, well, you know, the Soviets have done, been bombarding us ever since uh, 1976, July 4th to be specific, and a number of nations now have... Uh, ELF warfare going on. The bad thing about it is it's so covert, you don't have to declare war. The Soviet Union has never admitted that uh, they are bombarding, let's say, the U.S. and certain portions of it on a daily basis. Uh, and the U.S. has never admitted publicly that we are bombarding the Soviet Union. And this kind of stuff goes on. And when you're in areas like the United Nations in New York and you have kind of sensitive detection equipment that I use, you can go around in the perimeter about a half a mile and see the tremendous amount of warfare going on between different countries. And so it's a very insidious and vicious thing, in my opinion. Could you get really closer to your microphone, Andrea? We still have that bad line. Well, I'm cut. sorry. I'm, I'm choking it. Am I uh, okay now? That's better. Oh, That's okay. Better. Sorry about that. I do have some good news for you, though. Yeah. But a... Uh... A major contract was left with a major aerospace firm here in Southern California during the course of the last 10 days to begin preliminary research into scalar interferometry. Hey, hooray, that's the first breakthrough I've heard in a long time. I think the company probably said, say what? But, you know, <laughs> they'll take the contract and go on with it as much as they can, probably yeah. using Tom's work and your work and some of the other as the basis. Yeah, for really, Tom has been the great pioneer in punching through all the mystery of, of the... ELS signals, and uh, he and I have been buddies on this project for about eight, nine years now. Well, uh, Andre, is there any um, magazine or journal uh, reference you could give us um, about this, or is it still in the covert stage? Actually, the only real reference that uh, our government, the U.S. government, has released is a videotape made in 1984, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, by Eldon Bird, who is chief of biological uh, effects of ELF for the U.S. Navy. And uh, that can be ordered from the headquarters of the uh, U.S. Psychotronic uh, Association in Chicago. And uh, I'll dig up the address and telephone. I think it's $40 for the videotape. And that's the best documentation I know about. Hey, great. I mean, there, there's other literature. I'll give you a small example of how confusing some of this literature is. The World Health Organization this uh, spring, 1986, released a, a full-scale publication, about a 100-page journal, entitled uh, Extremely Low Frequency Waves. And half the uh, contributors were Russian, and half of them were Americans. I know all the American scientists, and I know all the American scientists work on classified projects on the ELF for the U.S. government. And if you go through that publication from cover to cover, you will not find one mention of ELF warfare. And my conclusion from reading that is that uh, it's very simple, that the U.S. and the USSR have some kind of a tacit gentleman's agreement, you know, and uh, nobody's going to mention that this dirty stuff exists. Now, if you will just take down this uh, number, uh, this is the uh, number of Mr. Robert Boitlich, spelled B-E-U-T-L-I-C-H, and uh, he is the Secretary Treasurer of the United States Psychotronic Association, which publishes the uh, videotape of Elvin Bird. And his number, are you ready to write this down? We're writing. Okay. Area code 312. Seven two eight eight nine four one. 
think if anybody is interested, they should just write to Bob and uh, forty dollars, as I understand the last price, and they'll get an extraordinary tape, which is a overview of uh, everything going on in the U.S. government that uh, you know is not super classified. Well, we don't want them to give away national security secrets, but there is a level of this information that the public needs to know about. They oh, need. Yes. To... You see, the reason the public has to know is that everyone is involved. It's just like radioactivity that spreads around the world from an accident in Soviet Union. Everybody should know about it. And I've been a very diligent propagandist for the last eight or nine years trying to get the public alert that there is a clear and present danger. Well, one of the things that you're doing, I think, is important, that little wristwatch you have. I have a little device at my house that fills a room with an 8 hertz wave. Uh-huh. Uh, well, scaler. That, that's pretty helpful. Very helpful. In fact, the, the flowers will last about two weeks in that room. Yeah, isn't it amazing? The other thing is if flowers are dying or drooping, you can just expose them to this 8 hertz signal, and uh, they perk up. They perk up right now. Incidentally, you might be interested, Bill and Alan, the one of the really major discoveries I feel I've made in the last three years, is, but as you both know, I've spent a lot of time going around the world looking at super healers, uh, mm -hmm. people yeah. who really have a track record, and I've been able to measure what comes off their hands when they do healing, particularly if it's laying on a hand healing, and every one of them that I've been able to measure on every continent puts out an 8 hertz ELF wave. And it was based on that that uh, I was able to develop the watch as a, I, I hate to use the word, but it's something that has a healing effect. In other words, it'll counter negative effects that uh, you would get from being exposed to various frequencies of ELF. Well, Andre, uh, would this uh, 8 hertz uh, emission also affect the molecular structure of water? Yes, that uh, is something that was discovered, perhaps you remember it better than I, uh, quite a while ago, uh, by some work Doug, done by Doug Dean, I think it was about 10 years ago, and uh, another fellow in uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, you remember his name? Uh, oh, yeah, Robert, Robert Miller, a chemist. Robert Miller, yeah. yes. So that finding has been around for a while, and the structure that's affected in water is that the bond angle of the OH, oxygen-hydrogen, molecule of H2O or HOH uh, is affected and that is what uh, uh, resonates or puts out the 8 hertz signal out of water. This is a very interesting sideline. I found a, a, a fellow in Israel who is a healer, really quite remarkable, one of the best in, uh, in Israel, and he found out quite by accident that if he put his hands around a bottle of water and then a patient drank it, they would get the same effect as uh, they would if he personally put the, uh, put uh, his hands on them. So I brought him over to the United States about two or three years ago. I think it was in fall of 83. And uh, I had very sophisticated lab equipment, so I couldn't plug over to Israel. And I measured his uh, imprinting of the 8 hertz signal on the water. And now I've been observing that water for uh, two and a half years, and it still retains the 8 hertz uh, signal coming off of it. So that's very exciting stuff. Well, that's remarkable. Uh, you might be interested to know that uh, here in Los Angeles, uh, the Mobius Society just did an experiment with uh, 14 healers uh, treating water. Yes. And this experiment was incredibly significant. Yes. Uh, like 2,500 to one odds. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's the same kind of work exactly. Yeah, re right. uh, replicating Douglas Dean's yes. work essentially. Right. Well, I have a new thing for treating water for you. Yeah. Brand new. <laughs> Working with it right now. And uh, we'll get to that in just a second. My guest tonight on the conference line is uh, Dr. Andrea Paharic. So happy to have him back for an encore with us tonight. In studio with me is Alan Vaughn, psychic researcher, psychic himself. Oh, all kinds of things. Author, lecturer. Delighted to have him here. It's open mind. I know. Well, an area that's going to require you to have somewhat of an open mind and to lead you along the way. Uh, one of the masters in the field. Speaking on our conference line tonight is Dr. Andrea Paharic. And with me in studio is one of the nation's finest psychic researchers and just investigators into all of these wonderful things we like to get into and present to you on the table, this forum, this seminar we have every Saturday night that we call Open Mind. 
Uh, Andre, I was going to talk to you about some water work for a second. Uh, our good friend John Bedini has developed an interesting new technique of using scalar to develop the uh, a new kind of control ring on the magnets. And he has produced a magnet that actually resonates at 10,000 hertz. And we have stuck that little magnet in the spa at home. And now we have to use nothing in there at all. Of course, the crystals are working well, but we don't even have to use the coagulants now. It just throws everything out of the water. Surface tension has been dropped about 60%. Oh, John, and I think he's a brilliant scientist, and uh, we need more people like him. got to get his work out. But uh, you can take any kind of water, just put it in a glass and stick it on, in top of the standing waves that that magnet uh, develops. Yes. And it has purified it in a matter of five or six seconds. Yeah, that's incredible, isn't it? That's because it acts on the magnetic... Uh dipoles or little magnets, uh, every proton in water, you know, which is hydrogen, uh, uh, reacts to that kind of a field. Well, he is coming from another point of view here on magnetism, uh, Andrea. I don't know whether you are aware of it or not, but he's pretty well convinced that uh, magnetic lines of force are interdimensional. Yes, I believe that. The fact that is, is we, we believe that... Uh, uh, the kind of waves that we're talking about, like scalar waves, to be very precise, uh, have a nine-dimensional characteristic, and mm -hmm. that seems to fit in very well with some of the most advanced thinking in uh, modern science, uh, which is what is called string theory, and uh, I think his invention illustrates that very dramatically. Well, he is certainly pulling energy from somewhere. <laughs> and uh, he is now convinced he was perplexed about, you know, he's done it in many different kinds of ways. Yes. Where some of it was coming from. And uh, it's pretty well established in his mind and in the research over there at his laboratory that they are attracting really uh, energy from another dimension. Yes. Which uh, and, uh, boggles the mind of a lot of people. Yeah, and I, I think uh, we ought to form a society for the protection of John Bedini to keep him going because he's doing such incredibly advanced work that there are going to be people around who will think, well, we got to get rid of this guy. Well, that's already <laughs> being taken <laughs> care of, and indeed that's uh, has, those attempts have been made on a couple of occasions, I'm sorry yes. to say. Yes, we've all had a few little uh, attentions like that, folks. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, Bill, would you mind if I mentioned about this, uh, these two seminars I'm giving out in California and L.A. particularly on October 18th and 19th? Yeah, I'd mind, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to... Uh, no, of course not. Go right ahead. Yeah, anybody who's interested can just uh, dial area code 213-393-9405. I'll repeat that, 213-393-9405, and they get, can get all the necessary information. Well, let me add that uh, on Saturday the 18th, uh, Andre, we were doing a, a seminar at the a, um, Marriott Hotel at LAX, and on the Sunday, the following day, is an intensive in which he gets into such deep things we understand as healing, uh, psychic surgery, earth changes, UFOs, Harry Geller. Andre, Andre you, you, you never run out of things. to talk about all of these things? You know. Yes, that and a few more things. I can imagine. Things that you can't easily get in a print, but you can say because uh, we can still speak freely in this country. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm real curious um, about the uh, your latest research or information on UFOs and UFO communications. Uh, well... Let me just put it very simply. Uh, for some 33 years now, I've been in contact with uh, some kind of advanced expert terrestrials. Uh, I've written a little bit about it, not too much, who are known as the Nine. And uh, the Nine seem to pop through occasionally. And it's not a regular thing. Once there was a lapse of about 18 years between communications and... Uh, the communications, just so you understand, come in a num number of different ways. They've come through several channels, human beings. Uh, the second mode is uh, they seem to like to take over radio, telephone, uh, television, uh, usual kind of electronic modes of communication that we use, or even electronic typewriters. 
Would they like to be a guest on my show? <laughs> yeah, well, wouldn't that be something? I'll have to ask them. Right. Uh, of course, I want you to understand, they have no uh, form. They, <laughs> they're like pure space. You're speaking about interdimensional stuff. Anyway, I don't think you'd have <laughs> uh, Anyway, in person, they wouldn't do well, but they could take over and gimmick your system. That would be okay. Anyway, that's the background. We've got engineers that do that. Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> concerned about man's incredible power, uh, you know, nuclear energy and that sort of thing, and the ELF, and also uh, somewhat low state of development in high political office uh, amongst people who have control of these kind of systems. Seems to be that upside down, doesn't it? Pardon? It seems to be upside down, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, you know, the way, the way things are, and I've written about this in several books. There's one called Prelude to the Landing on Planet Earth, which goes into a lot of this stuff in detail. So I uh, recently had a meeting in uh, the group I work with uh, scattered around the world. We met in Austria this time uh, about 10 days ago, and we got an update on the planetary situation. And I must say, it's not very encouraging, because what it amounts to is that the planet is under heavy stress by starvation and flood and drought and, I mean, extremes of every natural thing you can think of, volcanoes and earthquakes and so on. And the record bears that out. That's no mystery. And uh, they made a kind of a plea, and I'm passing it on for people to somehow straighten out their outlook on life and their consciousness and, you know, try to be loving and helpful not only to other human beings but to animals and the planet Earth and try to stop this ravage uh, of the planet that's going on. So that's kind of the latest uh, message that I'm very sincere about and really would like to have people think about it seriously. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, and we, a little bit later, at about 10.30, are going to take a break in what we're doing to talk about an effort that kind of follows in that line that's going Good. on. It's called uh, A Million Minutes for Peace. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes, I, that's the kind of idea that, that should be put in effect. They'll have a, uh, a huge uh, gathering at the Hollywood Bowl from 2 to 4 on Wonderful. October 18th. Wonderful. There will be a number of people there. Yeah. And it's very hard, Andrea, I think, for a lot of people to say that if you would just pledge a, a minute of your thoughts for peace, that you can do something viable. But I think we know that a thought can do something extremely viable, being that it's in the virtual state. Yes. It is a thing. It and is energy. Also, we know from a lot of unusual people on the planet now, and I mentioned Peter Herkus as another one, mm -hmm. the Geller and a few others, their thoughts uh, carry out actions at a distance that are quite incredible. Uh, just for a small example, uh, Roy Geller recently, a week ago, published a book uh, about what he's been doing the last 10 years. And in that book, he revealed something which I've known for 14 years, that most of his work has really been uh, in psychic warfare for the Israeli government, particularly the army. And uh, that's been his secret life. And all this other stuff, the public stuff, and arguing with Randy and so on, is just a cover to make him look like an idiot. But uh, when you understand some of the things that people like that can do, uh, it, it is uh, incredibly awe-inspiring, and everybody should feel that they have the capability of doing it. Therefore, uh, an event like you're talking about for October 18th is what should be done all over the planet. People have incredible power that they don't realize. Well, we'll uh, get into that a little bit later. Yeah. I certainly am going to be a part of it. And you're going to be in town. Maybe I can drag you down there and oh, get you up on the stage at the absolutely. Hollywood Bowl. Absolutely. Love to come. And uh, get all of our friends out yes, there. Yes, we must. I have a bunch of friends that are beginning to stack up on the telephone lines that want to uh -oh. talk to you. Okay, let them roll. All right, let them roll. Let me give the numbers here. In Los Angeles, a holistic kind of life that we should be living, the reality of the UFO, and I'll get him to touch for just a moment on the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull, if he will, yeah. when we return on Talk Radio 79. Rich. He's on our conference line from the East Coast, and in studio with me is Alan Vaughn. Uh, Andrea, tell us yes. a little bit about the Mitchell Hedges Crystal Skull. We'll be doing a show next week on that with Nick Messerino. Okay. Uh, I've worked with uh, Miss Mitchell Hedges, who lives in Kitchener, Ontario, in Canada, for about the last six years. 
whenever I get a chance, I go up there and do continue my studies of the crystal skull. Now, basically, uh, the skull has been studied by a lot of scientists. For example, Hewlett Packard in California had the skull for about six years. Uh, Miss Mitchell Hedges is very generous about loaning the skull to people who are serious about studying it. Mm -hmm. And the main finding that they made was that they could not find any signs of tool marks on it. In other words, they don't know how it was fabricated. We can't do it with our best technology. No, we cannot do it. And uh, that's one point. So since you can't find tool marks and so on, you can't really date it. So nobody knows how old it is. experience the, the visual images that come yes, up from the uh, skull. I, I'm a little bit like Alan Vaughn. Every once in a while I push my mind out into the ether and, and see what it picks up. And uh, one of the things that uh, I found, and some of my colleagues, some of them are psychic, some of them are not, have found is that the, com the, the skull is very much like a giant computer bank. In other words, it picks up information and stores it. And if you, if you, for example, most people aren't aware of this ability, and one of the greatest people on the planet with this ability is Peter Herkus, who lives in Studio City, California. Right here around the corner. Yes, and Peter can touch any object that some other human being has touched, and it's incredible to watch him get information from that one-touch contact. He can go on for hours doing a dossier on a person starting with their birth and going on into the future. Well, did uh, Peter ever touch the crystal skull? No, it's one of the things uh. that he and I have got on our schedule. We've got about a uh, hundred things like that we should do, but we've got to do that because if there's going to be a solution to the mystery of the skull, Peter will find it. So, Peter, I hope you're listening to me. We've got to take a trip up to Canada and do it. Well, see. But anyway, that's the nature of the skull. It has all this information on it, and it's not too difficult to access in terms of place, time, and so on, so on. It'll even play back information that you have given it if you're watching Oh, absolutely, longer. yes. I mean, you can probe it for things that happened tens of thousands of years ago and so on. And it, it's a vast, complex subject. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, the skull is, is given a home uh, that is proper for its, its great value. Well, I don't know why it's not being subjected to the most strenuous kind of scientific examination. Well, unfortunately, you know, parapsychology is not exactly high-level, high-energy science. I don't know, but if you've got an artifact that is playing back images, yes. and even the photographs of the images change, yes. Yes. as is the case with the photographs that were taken on Kodak film, the photographs change, you know you're dealing with something quite unusual. Yes, and I, I've tried uh, with my little influence to get major foundation to get behind this as a major study. And I'm making a little progress, but we have not launched a major study yet. Well, we'll uh, get deeply into that with Nick Nessarino next week, and I oh, thank yeah. you very much for uh, sharing a little bit of the work that you have done with the yeah. Mitchell Hedges skull. And Leroy wants to talk to you in just a moment about uh, those low-frequency waves and how yes. harmful they are around his house. And we'll get to that in just a second. I'm Bill Jalair Leroy. Hello. Yes. Nice to listen to your show. Good evening, gentlemen. How are you? Good evening. Just calling from Chatsworth here. Um, the question I have is uh, something to do with high-tension wires and electrical pollution. Does it have an effect on, on people? Let's say, like where I live, I have some high-voltage wires right outside my apartment. And I wonder if that's, if that's a negative to, to my being. Electronic smog. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, study done on that, particularly by Dr. Robert Becker, 
formerly of Syracuse University, now retired, and uh, they have shown that people living near high tension lines, usually about 750,000 volt potential, uh, do have adverse effects, behavioral effects, and uh, cows, for example, produce less milk, and there are other signs of biological effects. Now, we believe that it's not so much the uh, high potential that does it, but the magnetic uh, vector or the magnetic part of the uh, field that does the dirty work. And uh, there's some studies done, strange enough, by the U.S. Navy uh, and published in Science Magazine, February 23, 1984, in which uh, the Navy tried to find out what frequencies have the maximum effect on the DNA of cells. And they clearly showed that somewhere between 60 hertz and 76 hertz, uh, there was a maximum effect in what's called mutagenesis. That means pushing cells toward the direction of cancer. And uh, that was a shocker when it came out because the Navy has been trying, U.S. Navy has been trying to sell the American public for some 25 years on the idea that ELF is good for your health and that nobody should obstruct the, uh, the uh, uh, transmission of ELF to submarines. Well, uh, that's a very interesting and uh, highly controversial area. Of course, the ELF communication with submarines is out of hand. The Russians now do it verbally yep. with uh, with Scalar. Thank you very much, Leroy, for that question. We're going to take a break for the news at 10. Be right back with Dr. Andrea Pohovich and Alan Vaughn. A two of Open Mind. My name is Bill Jenkins. My guest tonight is Dr. Andrea Pohovich. He is on our conference line. We're talking about Oh, you name it, and we'll talk about it. In studio with me is also Alan Vaughn. And while the news was going on, something rather delightful happened. I want to share that with you, if I may. So come on in. Our good friends at the Alexandria 2 bookstore drop by. Ralph, say hello. Mm -hmm. And congratulations to the store and uh, all of the, the good work that you're doing down there. Let's see. Um, try it again. Say hello. Hello. There you go. I forgot to turn your mic on, Ralph. I was going to talk to you. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. And everybody was going to have to hear you by ESP. What is this that you dropped by here? This is a new creation that you've helped us create. It uh, looks like an Easter basket. Yeah, it does, it's but got... what kind of Easter eggs are in that basket? Uh, runes, uh, incense, candles, a couple books, some crystals. All kinds of neat things. And oh. some things you'll discover when you open it up. Ah, I'm looking forward to it. This is something we're going to put together for the holiday season to make some baskets for people to give as gifts. Well, it's a birthday present for Bill. I didn't even know that you knew I had a birthday coming down the line. ESP. Yeah, <laughs> ESP, yes. I'm going to be 25 <laughs> on Tuesday, or 26, or somewhere again. I thank you very much. It is just gorgeous. What's in the mummy? Uh, we have all kinds of stones, amethyst, sodalite, carnelian, tourmaline, <laughs> and <clears throat> about a dozen others. <laughs> all kinds of things. Oh. Just little little goodies from the Alexandria II bookstore. Huh? Yeah. All wrapped up in a... It's a beautiful gift. Thank you. And I thank you very, very much. We'd like to thank you also, Bill. <clears throat> Your show has been a lot of support and the listeners, and it's given us a lot of um, reason to keep going on, and the feedback's been tremendous and phenomenal, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you and Victoria for the uh, the marvelous work you do at Alexandria, too, and uh, bringing the books, the information, uh, the, the ambiance and the atmosphere for those that are on the quest that want to find out that there is more to life than most of us know. And it's very, very exciting out there. I'm, I'm excited about the success of your show, of your, uh, of your store, and very delighted and honored to be a part of it. Thank so, you. Uh, my congratulations to you and Victoria, and thank you so very much for the, for the basket. I can't wait. To get <laughs> but I'll have to wait till Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> oh, I, I don't think it'll last. <laughs> I don't think so. Either. I think that the temptation will be too much to rip in to that beautiful thing. But let us go on. We have Andrea Paharic on the line. Andrea? Yes. Are you ready? Uh, you should see this basket. It's got everything in there but uh, but your little clock. 
All right. All right, Roger's been waiting. You're on the line, Roger. Welcome aboard. Thank you very much. I'd first like to ask uh, the doctor uh, where these watches or where these watches can be obtained with the 8 megahertz signal. Be bringing, uh, my staff will be bringing them out to the two seminars, and uh, the people who are arranging these... Can you speak up a little bit more, Andrea? That line is terrible. People who are arranging the seminar will also have some for sale, so they'll be out there uh, when we get out there October 18th and 19th. Would you be happen to be giving any uh, conferences in Honolulu? Uh, no, but uh, I think I probably will do it because I have a lot of good friends there. It's a fun place to go, too. Oh, I love it. Uh, in connection with the scalar wave thing, have you found that anybody, you know, see, and government seems to ignore the whole thing, yet, in a sense, it seems like this is the strongest type of uh, war activity the Russians are actually waving against us. An undeclared war. Yes, I absolutely agree with you, and I must say I've spent a lot of time in our nation's capital, Washington, talking to senators, congressmen, military people about this, and uh, the, the general reaction, my God, how come I didn't know about this? And then uh, they check around a little bit, you know, through official channels, and they find out that it's something you're not supposed to talk about, and pretty soon they drop out of it. Hmm. So the general policy of our government is not to let the public know what's going on, because they're, uh, as in the case of the UFO story for the last 40 years, afraid people are going to panic, but that's not true at all. People, you know, are common sense folk, and if somebody says there's a war going on, they say, well, let's uh, put on some armor, let's defend ourselves. And that's all I'm saying, uh, that, you know, it, it is going on, it's possible to defend yourself, and we've now worked out some very simple technologies available to everybody to do this, so that's what the battle is all about. There seems to be a tendency in Washington that only the bushy brains of Washington should deal with the weighty problems of the day. That you we, the so sheep, right, sir. that we, the sheep of the United States of America, are to uh, keep ourselves uh, involved in the RTD uh, problems and things like that. Now, but just, don't you know, chew away at the grass and don't give me any trouble, man. <laughs> yeah, they just forget that the combined genius of the American people is rather strong, Absolutely. but they need to include us. On the ELF, you were mentioning that we are also engaging in it against the Russians. Yes, we are. We have uh, giant transmitters in uh, certain places in Australia, in McMurdo Sound in the Antarctic. We have one in South Africa, a couple of others still under construction. So the warfare is going on, and what's bad about it is that uh, wherever the beams go, let's say from the Antarctic to Russia, they cross... Uh, a lot of living things in the way, and every living thing in the path of ELF is affected, whether it's plant, bacteria, sea creatures, for example. I'm sure everybody has noticed in the newspapers for the last seven or eight years that <coughs> dolphins have been beaching themselves, and right. whales, and so on and so on. The reason this is going on, and nobody will admit it, is that these creatures are ultra-sensitive to these uh, ELF warfare signals, the only way they can get away from them is to get out of the water. And, uh, I mean, this is this is what's terrible. Every creature that's alive is being punished by this, I think, very stupid type of warfare. Nobody wins. I have the feeling what you also are saying is that even though the Russians are engaging it, we're probably more stupid to retaliate with the same weapon. It's the only retaliation against it. You see, right in the very beginning, and I was very active back in the early 70s, uh, 76, 77, in trying to capture the attention of the Western nations, uh, Canada, U.S., the U.N., etc., and uh, nobody would respond because the word went out, you don't talk about this thing. At that time, the reason was very simple. The U.S. was way behind the Soviets. It took them about three years to even begin to catch up. And that policy has remained ever since then. And I think every citizen who is aware of this should look into what is briefly as possible and get on the back of his representative, whether it be the state or the uh, federal government or Congress, whatever. I think this is a concern to everybody. Well, I get reports, for instance, Andrea, and I know you're familiar with this, uh, particularly here in the Los Angeles area, of those strange signatures in the sky. Yes. 
uh, of the radial formation of clouds and the square crosshatch cloud formation. As you know, nature has always made square clouds. But we have square clouds that happen over Los Angeles quite often. It looks quite often they look like they were made by a ruler. Yeah, well, you have one of the great experts uh, in the United States in your area, Dr. Bob Beck. Mm -hmm. And uh, he certainly is aware of everything going on there. He certainly can be an effective guide to the public in terms of, uh, you know, uh, getting the facts before them so something can be done. All right, Roger, does that help you? Yeah, I, I don't... Uh, do you feel that we should disengage ourselves from the waging this ELF on our end? Well, I think uh, any disengagement would be helpful, but, you know, this is war, and yeah. you, can't, you can't get one side or the other to make the first move. Right. We've got to have some kind of diplomatic initiative at the summit. Hopefully and, they'll and talk I about that. that's on the agenda in the coming summit meeting. Well, thank you very much, Doctor. You're welcome. All right, Roger. Appreciate your call. My pleasure. Our numbers, if you want to talk to Dr. Andrea Pohoric, let me give them to you again. Los Angeles 520-TALK, T-A-L-K. San Fernando Valley 990. All of the numbers end in talk. In Orange County 750. Burbank, Glendale, and Pasadena 244. 448 in the San Gabriel Valley. It's 679 in the South Bay area and down in Long Beach, San Pedro, Paramount, that area. Your number is 639, and your chance to talk to Andrea Paharic and to Alan Vaughn on Open Mind on KABC. So Andrea Paharic, and in studio is Alan Vaughn, and uh, we are talking to uh, Pedro. Hi, Pedro. Ah, good evening, Guillermo. I mean, William. I'm sorry about that. Willer. Willer. Yeah, Willer. Yeah, weary, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm in a variety of an open mind program because I read the most fascinating book from Mexico City. It's about what exactly what you're talking about. It's very controversial. And let me tell you a little bit about the author. Excuse me, author is first, part of my English. Uh, this man is a priest, Father Rosario Sanchez Montilla, who was detained by the Mexican government during World War II under orders from the United States because he supported the Axis. Now, this book very good. This man has tremendous insight. And uh, it's most fascinating. Okay, his whole thesis is on the UFOs. I mean, it's about how the UFOs come out of, uh, he believes they come out of Tel Aviv in Israel under there. You know, he had his thesis. They come from the bottom of the earth, but out of Tel Aviv. He believes that uh, the Zionist Jews, the fighting things, that they get over, they pass over, they take the Christian children, the white children, and they uh, suck the blood, and they drop them back down on the earth. Now, this may be hard to believe. Pedro? Yes? Hold on. I, I, got, I have an open mind, Pedro, but you just, uh, you just right, crossed right. over. I like your name, Andrea, your friend, because you might be a Mr. Artukovic, not just be deported by this country. All right, Pedro. I got it in. Okay. Oh, boy. And you know, that happens so very rare. I think maybe that's the first, or maybe the second time in eight years yeah, that that I mean, kind of a call has come through. Yeah, that's embarrassing. Well, it's embarrassing for Pedro, I would think. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, uh, Andre, didn't you see a number of UFOs in Israel? Yes, but uh, they weren't gobbling up uh, Christians and all that. Oh, well, yes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, with a Heil Hitler attached. There. With a little mythology. Yeah. I, I uh, you know, one of the UFO incidents that fascinates me is the time uh, that Isla Zebel, who was with the Wisconsin Society yes. for Psychical Research, was riding with you and Uri in a car through the desert in Israel, yeah. seeing these incredible UFO displays, lights flashing all around, and then you picked up some hitchhiker, and he hadn't seen a thing. Yeah, that was one of the things we learned early in our observations of uh, real UFOs. When I say real UFOs, I mean extraterrestrial, because I also believe uh, there are UFOs that are used as military weapons on the planet Earth because they were developed by the Germans clearly documented in 1944. They were making some good strides at it. They didn't yeah, have the power were, plants, but they certainly had yeah, the air they were doing great things, and of course, the U.S. picked up the technology, and Boeing developed it, and now they're operational, etc. But I'm not talking about that type. They're, anybody who knows UFOs can spot those. But the kind we saw in uh, Israel was truly extraterrestrial craft. And I'll give you just one quick example, which you briefly alluded to already, uh, Uri and I and Isla Zebra were in the war zone, and what we were doing were using Uri's abilities to distinguish uh, real signals on the radar and certain false signals, and the Israeli military were picking
picking up UFOs on the radar, but they didn't know the signature, and they were always good at that, so he straightened them out. Anyway, going back to Tel Aviv, uh, unfortunately, being in a war zone, we could not carry cameras or any other recording equipment, so we were not able to document what we witnessed subsequently uh, on film. But to make a long story short, we had a uh, staff sergeant driving a command jeep, and we had a colonel sitting beside him, who was our escort, and the three of us were sitting in the back of the command jeep. And I looked to the left along, we were the Mitla Pass area, incidentally, and I looked up at a ridge to our left, which was you know, probably five, six hundred feet high, and I saw an incredibly huge UFO, which was very metallic, like anodized aluminum in appearance. And I noticed several odd things immediately. First, I guesstimated probably the length of an American football field, namely about 100 yards, but I couldn't be sure of that because it's desert air. But the thing that, re that really was striking was 6.30 in the morning was that there was no reflection of the morning sun off this craft. All the rays were absorbed. And furthermore, there was no shadow under the craft. All the rays again were absorbed. And so I really was puzzled by this whole thing. And I uh, nudged Uri and pointed to the thing without saying a word. And he immediately saw what I saw. And then <clears throat> Myla saw the same thing. So he wanted to know if the two officers in front could see the same thing. So Uri spoke to them in Hebrew and said, uh, what is that funny looking thing on the top of that ridge? And they looked up there and they said, oh, that's just some sagebrush. And w that thing followed us for an hour and a half to our base, air base, where we took a military plane back to Tel Aviv. And they never saw it, and yet we saw it as clear as we saw each other. But that's the other thing we saw over and over again. And what I learned from that is that the beings and the UFOs can can command uh, or, or take over your perception and your uh, sensation of what you think you're experiencing. So I myself am never quite sure, as an honest observer and scientific observer, what I am looking at when I'm in the presence of a true UFO experience, because I know they can control your mind. Well, I have another observer here uh, that is a part of the regular crew here at KABC, and perhaps you know, you've heard of him. His name is Paul Harvey. Of course. And uh, this was from a broadcast of Paul's on September 23rd of this year. Let's yes, take I a listen to see what Paul had to say. UFO over Luxembourg this morning. Police saw it. Air traffic controllers and commuters saw it. Five or six bright green lights traveling at incredible speed at about 600 feet altitude. It did not show up on radar. So, uh... Paul Harvey talks about the flying saucers. Yes, my uh, son, who lives in Holland, uh, was driving uh, back to uh, Holland from Munich, Germany, where he put me on a plane, and uh, he didn't see the craft himself, but he talked to many witnesses who saw the uh, craft over five uh, country area, and it made all the local papers in France, Germany, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Holland. Well, I got on Paul Harvey News on ABC, so we yeah. can tip our hat to ABC yeah. for just a little bit. I'm talking to Dr. Andrea Pohanrich, along with Alan Vaughn here. We're talking about UFOs, scalar waves, ELF waves. We've even gotten to the crystal skull. And most anything you want to talk about, these other men can talk about it with you. I may, to remind you of something that's very important. We touched upon it earlier with Dr. Pohanrich, and that is the million minutes for peace uh, worldwide movement that is sanctioned by the United Nations and almost every every nation um, in the country and every corporation are putting their stamp of approval upon it and their support. Mayor Bradley, the people here in Los Angeles, they'll be having a, a great gathering at the Hollywood Bowl on October 18th from 2 to 4 in the afternoon. It is free. The Hollywood Bowl people very graciously donated the bowl for this effort. Uh, on that Sunday afternoon, I'm going to be there. A lot of people will be there we would like for you to be there. And there has been a wonderful song written to go about this idea of pledging a moment, a minute, for peace. And we'll talk about the power of that. We touched upon it a little bit earlier, in a little bit. But I want you to listen to this and pledge, if you will, a minute for peace. Simple as 
to pledge a minute for peace, a minute of thoughts for peace, and let's find out how you can do that. Hello, who are we talking to here? To Joan Deary. Hello, Joan. Hello, Bill. How are you? Welcome back to Open Mind. We had a <laughs> marvelous time with Joan as we first talked about the Million Minutes for Peace uh, campaign that's going on all over the world. Somebody wants to get involved in this, Joan. What do they do? Well, there's several ways they can do it. Um, they can either call me here at uh, 850 1530, and I will send them a pledge form or take their pledge over the phone. Now, this is not a pledge for money. This is a no, pledge for a minute a pledge, of your time. Right. From 1 to 30 minutes between September 16th and October 16th. So we're getting close to October 16th, but it's not too late, late at all to pledge a minute of peace. Mm -hmm. And um, they can also, um, they have forms in the Bodhi tree, 
in Alexandria's in, and in the Phoenix Bookstore and at Fred Siegel's department store in Santa Monica are just some of the places that they can get them. Okay. Or they can write me at 8033 Sunset Boulevard, Suite 486, and I would be glad to send them to the press form. Tell us about what's happening at the Hollywood Bowl. Oh, this is very exciting. We're um, getting plans together to have um, an afternoon of music and celebration uh, to experience peace in, in the peaceful environment, of course, of the bowl. And we will have celebrity announcers, yourself included. Thank you. I don't know if it's a celebrity or not. <laughs> well, I think you are, Bill. You couldn't keep me away. Yes. We'll have a peace meditation, and the International uh, Children's Choir will perform, and they will um, get up, and they will uh, accept the minutes from their, you know, that have been donated for their country. And so they will re represent their various countries. And there will be birds of peace. Anything that you'd like to add to that right now? Yes, I would. First, I want to congratulate uh, everybody concerned with this movement, the composer and the um, performer and the lady who just spoke and so on. And I think it's a tremendous thing. May I just say very briefly that I probably one of the few people on Earth who's been privileged to see how powerful healing can be across large distances, people a thousand miles away can be healed by a person with that kind of power. And unfortunately, in modern psychic warfare, the same kind of thing is being used for destructive purposes. Exactly. And every nation on Earth has some kind of uh, psychic warfare operation uh, uh, going. And I think what we should do is use the power of prayer that everybody has, and I think we can turn this world around and make it a wonderful Garden of Eden. Thank you, Andrea, for that. I'm going to try to drag Andrea to the Hollywood Bowl with Oh, me. I wish you would. I, I, I'm going to get there, even though I have a lecture at that time. I'll bring all my people with me. All right. Oh, wonderful. We're encouraging everybody to bring their friends and family. Uh, they're, they're going to open the grounds for us at 11 a.m. so yeah. people could come and bring a picnic lunch. And right. the most Just... powerful transmitters in the world are the minds of children. So uh, yeah. that's bring an, them. That's another thing I wanted to say, Bill, is that we're encouraging all the children to to come and we're encouraging the schools to um have an art contest and then the one one picture from each school will be donated and brought to the grounds by 12 noon on october 18th and then we will have a contest and pick the picture and then that school and that child will receive a prize on the stage for the peace picture for the million minutes of peace Okay, Mary, thank you so very, very much. This is Joan. I mean, Joan. <laughs> yeah. Where am I? <laughs> Andre. Uh, Bill, may I ask you a question? I yes. talked to Peter Herkus last night. He indicated he would try to call in. Has he tried to call in yet? Uh, I, the lines are pretty, pretty stacked and full. Oh, I see. Could you give him a call? We could give him a call. Uh, Let me give you the number. Well, I don't want you to give Peter's okay, number on I'm the air. Sure. But right. I tell you what, while, when we take a, a break here for a commercial, which we're going to do for a second, we'll get the number for from you. Yeah. And uh, then we'll place a call to Peter Hercos, okay? Perfect. All right. Mary, thank you. Thank you, Bill. And uh, we're looking forward to October 18th, 2 to 4 o'clock. Gates open at 11 at the Hollywood Bowl for a million minutes for peace. Make your pledge for more than a minute, and we might can turn this around. And you've seen or heard about some of the things that are happening to us because of psychic warfare, and this is another kind of psychic warfare of the most noble kind. I'm Bill Jenkins. It's a... On the conference line is Dr. Andrea Paharic coming back to open mind again. Andrea, I remember we... Stayed up till the wee small hours of the morning one night talking. We sure did, and I, I wanted you to give me a beautiful quotation from the Bible. You're so versed and scholarly about it, so I'm still waiting, Bill. Well, which one do you want? <laughs> I, I want you to pick it. Oh. You know, oh. something to do with a minute for peace. Oh, the minute for peace. There are so many in there. Yeah. I think perhaps the, the favorite one is the golden rule. Oh, of course. Given by Jesus. Do yeah. unto others as you would have them do unto you. Absolutely. Alan Vaughn is in studio with me and on our other conference line 
is Peter Herkos. Peter, welcome to Open Mind. Hi, good evening. So Hi, nice Peter. to... Hi, Andre. Peter, have you been in on all of these things we're talking about today? Well, I, I just put it on about uh, 20 minutes ago. Mm-hmm. In the million minutes for peace, what kind of power and impact do you think that can have? Well, I was brought over in 1956 by Andre Poharic, and we did a testing there for two and a half years by poor Andre. Yes, of course. And he is quite tough. You know, sometimes at 2 o'clock in the middle of the night, he said, come on, let's do a test. <laughs> Always wanting to test you out to make yes. sure you can do all of those things. And uh, I was living that time in Paris. I lived six years in Paris. And now I live in Studio City. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I take it very quiet. I also visit the president in his home. And I know the president, he was very skeptic too. And it was only an half hour later, and he was not skeptic anymore. You know, I President have, Reagan. I, I don't want Peter to, uh, you know, carry the ball entirely, but I might add that in uh, 1961, I introduced Peter to the CIA. They were so impressed with his... Well, we better not talk about that, Andre. I'm, but, you know, I'm still working. And, uh, <laughs> from that moment on, he's really going to be advisor to a lot of people in the U.S. government. Well, certainly his talents have been used for uh, oh, yes. many, many things. Yes. Oh, yes. I know I have tried to have Peter on the show a couple of times, but he always gets busy and we can't do it. So maybe Bill, we'll least, uh, Bill do you know me? I have never met you. I don't see a marriage. But you've met my daughter. Oh. On a movie, I think. Was there a separation between the two of them? There was. I know, Bill. Just uh, in the last uh, few weeks. You're very still active. And I'm not seeing you living in an apartment, but I see you living in a home. Yes, that's true. And don't move there. And I'm telling you again, Bill, there will be a terrible earthquake. We don't know. Nobody knows yet when, but it will be very close. Hmm. And I want you not to move. Stay where you are. And take the dead tree out your place. There is a dead tree that is dying. Hmm, I'll have to look for that one. Yeah. And I saw four in the family, not six. How many people are in the fa family, Bill? Uh, there are six to four children. That's correct. Yes. I saw four kids. There we are. They're all grown now. Right. Grown going on ten. <laughs> I see also a an, an graduation for a child that's going back to school. <laughs> that would be one of the grandchildren, I guess. Uh, you was in the hospital, Bill. Let me see. Long time ago, yes. Yes, about three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not an observation, but I uh, saw so an operation. Yes, a hernia operation. That's correct. It was only three days. That's about it, yeah. There. Right. <laughs> You're amazing, Peter. Well, you didn't see nothing. I, I never know that I could take a phone call and uh, tell people this. That is what Andre Poharis found out. I can take any phone call, I take any test what scientists may impose. Mm. And what I'm doing, I keep it very quiet in the studio city. You know, I live in a beautiful home mm -hmm. and have everything. So I'm not, uh, I'm not a man that makes publicity or anything. I never, I never write in papers, uh, here is Peter Hercules if you want to find me. You're just too busy. I'm too busy. You're busy doing very, very good work, and I really want to... Oh, I see sometimes people, but, but, you know, I'm traveling a lot, too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is for hard speaking. I want everybody to know that everybody in this world sleeps better at night because Peter is with us and watching the entire planetary scene. He has a scope of vision that uh, it is formidable. That boggles the mind. You know, when I was by Andre Poharis about eight months ago on the television Tokyo in Andre's laboratory, it's a beautiful laboratory there, and I broke two machines, a brainwave machine, read my mind, and a crystal. 
you know, I'm laughing now, but I screamed because it cost me about 6,000 bucks to replace it. <laughs> you broke his machine. <laughs> In fact, is Peter's wife won't let him in the office because if he walks by the Xerox machine, it blows up, or if he runs by the computer, it goes down. And I mean, his field of influence is incredible, and it isn't necessarily destructive. It's just that the equipment is not used to people like him. There's just an, an awful lot of energy there. Oh, a tremendous amount of energy. Did your daughter have a baby now? No, not yet. She will. Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. I see patients by your door. Peter, Peter, are you talking to me? <laughs> no, 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 doctor. No, no. <laughs> oh, if my daughters are listening, there's three of them. <laughs> They're all going to be jumping around now wondering to know which one it is, Peter. <laughs> I don't say the oldest one. <laughs> the oldest one. Right. Oh, she just Who's came. Michael? Michael. Mike. Mm. Did your daughter uh, broke up with Mike when she dated him? I don't know of a Mike. Oh. But I don't keep up with, you know, the goings around that closely of all of them. Right. But it was, uh... Hmm. I want to take a break here for commercials <laughs> and try to figure out who Mike is. We have Dr. Andre Paharic on the line, Peter Herkos, and in studio with us is Alan Vaughn. On open mic, we have Dr. Andre Paharic on the line, Peter Herkos from Studio City is on the line with us. Alan Vaughn in studio. I was just thinking, Peter, about my three daughters. They're all concerned, and perhaps so is Mike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> three girls and a boy, huh? <laughs> yes, that's right. There's a boy. Three too. girls and a boy, I saw. Uh -huh. Well, I be with Andre, the 18 in the Marriott on the airport hotel. Yeah, thank you, Peter. And I'm going to give a demonstration what you never, any skeptic, but come there, I will prove it to you. Fantastic. And, and anybody who wants to find out about that meeting can call 213-393-9405 and get all the information about the what, when, where, and the cost, etc., etc. And we will have watches for anybody who's interested in them to get protection from ELF. Now, there have been a lot of calls that just didn't but want to talk I, to I us. I promise you, Bill, uh -huh. I will show up to people. I hope you can come over. Uh, I demonstrate, and uh, I, I don't need any props or people. I take them out to the audience. Anybody but a skeptic. Would you come and do a show with me one night, Peter? Would Bill, you... I promise you, yes. Right. I will do a show with you. All right, we will... Come and call my mother. We will contact you... Uh... Call my wife, Mother Superior. Mother Superior? <laughs> right. We will call Mother Superior and try okay. to get you on in the next couple of weeks if your schedule will allow. But anybody skeptic, I take any test that scientists may impose. All right. Do you think that the government... Let's not put it this way. They say, i going to work with him. I do. <laughs> oh, you work with the government. You work I work with the CIA, FBI, different sections. I was travel a lot. Sometimes I see some people. And I, I'm, in the, I'm in the phone book. Uh -huh. But uh, I'm always busy, busy. <laughs> okay. well, I'm 75 years old, but I look about 55. Well, that's just because you got so much energy about you. That's right. All right. We're going to get some of that energy in studio in the next few weeks then, okay? I, but sure, I will do it, Bill. All right. And you'll be down with Andrea at the Marriott Hotel. I'm working with Andrea on the moment on a videotape at all uh, doctors, medical doctors, top people. And it's going to be a videotape, and I want Andre to talk about what we're going to do. All right. Yeah, I might just uh, chime in here. Uh, 31 years ago, when I first started working with Peter, he stumbled across a way of uh, flashing a uh, strobe light in people's eyes. But okay. the uh, trick was that they would uh, control the frequency of the strobe light. And Peter was one of the test subjects, and he really convinced me that this thing worked. And what, what would happen would be the following. Peter would look at the strobe light, and he would adjust the flash. Then he would see a cross in the field, and he would enter that cross. He would go out of his body, and I could send him anywhere in the world to look in the file cases, maps, whatever information. And he was right there. Peter's been going out of body, too, huh? Yeah, well, he's, he's incredible. So anyway, we figured after 31 years, the public is entitled to excuse 
that device and we're releasing it just to help consciousness raising on this planet. All right, thank you very much. Hang on, we're going to take a break for news. Peter, you want to stay on? Yes. All right, do that. We'll be back in about seven or eight minutes with Andrea Paharic, Peter Herka. Back east is Dr. Andrea Paharic. Alan Vaughn is in studio with me, and uh, Peter Herkos, I believe. Is, is Peter still on the line? Hello there. Is everybody here? Yes, I'm here. And Peter, you there? Yes, I'm here. And Alan, of course, is over there, too. Let's uh, check out these callers for a little bit. They've been waiting on the line for a while, and they've got quite a, an array of characters to get an answer. Let's talk I should about. like to be on your show and come over and straighten things uh, out. Straighten things out. Okay, Peter, you... You're on. We'll contact you, buddy, yes. and uh, make a date. And I think. But I was shocked. In anybody, if I said in the papers, I worked from a shot and tape case. I did this and this and this, and it was not true. He can sue the hell out of me. Okay. All right. That was a that was an off air call that Peter had with someone. Okay, Craig, you're on. Uh, hi. Hi. I wasn't sure you were going to take any more calls. Oh well, yes, we'll try to. Don't like to stay away from you too long. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not. Is uh, Peter Hurkus still on the line? Still on the line, right. Yes, I'm on the line. Uh, I wasn't sure if uh, you were expecting people to give you questions, too, or what. He wasn't, but we just did that. <laughs> <laughs> so I did have some questions uh, prepared for uh, uh, Dr. Buharis. But... We'll go right ahead, because Peter uh, and Andre have been working together, and uh, between the two, they can really give an answer. I'm having difficulty hearing the uh, uh, Craig. Okay, Craig, speak up, and uh, Andrea, get your mouth right in that right. mouthpiece. Uh, yeah. I'll speak as loud and clear as I can. Um, to go back to the discussion of the uh, ELF waves, uh, the last caller who was questioning you about that, I believe you were telling him that uh, the U.S. has constructed or is constructing uh, ELF generating or transmitting stations okay. in other countries, including yes. Canada and I believe you said South Africa. South Africa, uh, Antarctica, and uh, uh, Australia. Uh, Australia, I can understand, uh, given we have uh, defense agreements with them and other military uh, installations there. South Africa surprises me. Uh, Antarctica, I'm not sure what would be covered by the, uh, the treaty that governs uh, uses of Antarctica. Um, we're, what is the source of your information on this? Well, I have uh, my information directly from South African intelligence agents, and uh, not only do we have a transmitter there, but uh, about six countries surrounding South Africa uh, who are somewhat under the Soviet sphere of influence uh, have ELF transmitters that are bombarding South Africa and uh, while South Africa has a real social problem, it's being aggravated by the uh, uh, behavioral modification caused by these uh, transmitters, which are Soviet transmitters. So there's a whole undeclared war going on, and believe me, my information is very reliable. Do you have any, any sources? It's not that I doubt your personal integrity, but do you have sources outside of South African intelligence who have confirmed this? I don't know what you mean by sources. You mean uh, uh, intelligence sources? Uh, whatever sources. Yes, I have sources. Uh, well, look, I've been in this field for many years. I'm well known. I've spoken out uh, quite uh, strongly about my position about the bad features of ELF warfare, and I get all kinds of underground information. I think I would have greater uh, respect for the information that Andrea would have than an article in the New York Times. Thank you, sir. As, as I said, it's not a matter of... I, I, I'm familiar with Dr. Puharis going uh, back many years, but it, it, the question is whether he had sources outside of South African intelligence. I'm not sure I have a great deal of respect for them, frankly. Yeah, I, I, I really am not in any position to disclose my sources. Okay. Uh, what about Antarctica? In the same situation? An article? An Antarctica. Yeah. Oh, Antarctica, yes. Is that, uh, you can find out for yourself if you want to go down there and look around. So that's not uh, considered classified information? I don't think it is, but uh, <laughs> classified information is a very strange animal. Yes. Some guy puts a stamp on a piece of paper, you never saw it or heard of it, and you suddenly are surprised that it's classified. As far as I know, no. 
To a to a military bureaucrat, if you don't understand it, classify it. But I, I'm not trying to be a scare person. I'm just telling you the facts as I know them. And if I were in a court of law, I could justify that. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions then about uh, research on how ELS waves actually interact, as, as you were saying, with uh, DNA. Yes. Um, Okay, very briefly, I mentioned earlier, I don't know whether you heard me, that the Navy, which is in charge of all research on the biological effects of ELF, has released an hour uh, video documentary which cites, uh, which gives all the answers to your question. And I gave the, uh, the uh, telephone number of the secretary, treasurer of the U.S. Psychotronic Association where the uh, videotape can be obtained. So I think you can follow up on that. That's uh, Robert Bird's number? Uh, yeah, uh, Boitlich, B-E-U-T-L-I-C-H. Uh, my, my question was whether you could uh, offer uh, any uh, explanation as to the mode of interaction of ELSOs with DNA. I couldn't, and I'll do it very briefly. I don't want to bore the public with heavy technical stuff, but essentially... Uh, the fundamental particles, like a proton, are made up of three particles called quarks, quarks that cannot be measured because they're in the next dimension, so to speak. Each quark is made up of three omegons. It turns out that ELF interacts with omegons because they are magnetic monopoles, and they are, as we mentioned earlier, they are ninth dimensional kind of an energy object, and this is why ELF will interact with DNA very specifically, because it's the hydrogen bond resonant proton that activates a DNA to produce whatever it's supposed to produce, enzymes, etc. And it is uh, ELF. As a matter of fact, I can predict with great confidence that the future of entire medicine, all medicine, will be dictated by the knowledge of what ELF does to, uh, to, uh, uh, to DNA and to all fun biological functions. Uh, we're, we're entering in a stage of a biological knowledge that is formidable and probably frightening to a lot of people. I can tell you categorically that we have very simple instrumentation that anybody can build out a Radio Shack part produce ELF waves in the range from, let's say, one cycle per second up to about 100 cycles per second. And if you have ac accuracy to two decimal points, you can turn on and off any function of DNA that you want to. It, it, it is formidable what, what, what is uh, coming out of this, uh, this field of learning. There's going to be quite a conference on that next month here at the uh, Sheridan Premier Hotel. Yes, and I hope to be there. I haven't... Uh, I've got a little conflict with another conference in Europe, but I'm going to try to get to the one in uh, Los Angeles. Because they've got uh, everybody who is anybody there. Right. Uh, the dealing in this conference. whole new area of electro-bioenergetics. -bio -bio yeah, they've got some of the best workers in the entire world that are coming to that meeting. Well, I'm going to be there, too. Good. We'll be there. <laughs> All, right. All right. Craig, does that help you? Uh, just one last minor detail for Dr. Hart. Earlier, you were saying as... as yeah, I'm sorry, I can't hear a word you're saying, Craig. It's just I'm having difficulty. I'm sorry, is that better? That's better. Uh, earlier you were saying that the, I believe you said, the prime effect of ELF on DNA was cholinergic. But uh, from what you just said, that's only one of the effects. No, that's, effect. that's for a certain frequency range. Right. That's uh, centered at 6.66 hertz specifically, but the effect does go down to 5 hertz. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You want to know if other effects have been, have been observed? Yes. Uh, if you get that videotape, you will find uh, effects. That you can produce cancer in animals in 24 hours if you know the right frequency. You can produce any behavioral modification that you can imagine with the right frequencies. You can cause all kinds of mutations in, in uh, well, the work is being done on insects by Dr. Delgado in Madrid, but there's a tremendous range of effects that you will hear about from that one videotape. All right, Craig. Uh, no, no, you, you know what, I, I just realized I had one last guy didn't cross off here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I,
Make, make it quick. Yes. Uh, this relates to the ground wave uh, emergency network. I'm sure you're familiar with that, Dr. Kahar. Uh, I wish you could, somebody could repeat that. I can't hear uh, He wants to know if you're familiar with the ground wave emergency network. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, well, it, uh, as I understand it, it's uh, using ERF for uh, uh, strategic command and control around the country, around the continental United States. Uh-huh. They're supposed to be constructing somewhere around 20 uh, different stations in various locations. Is this what's ordinary called the ELF Communications Project, Seafair Project, uh, 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 Sandman, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Well, evidently it goes beyond that, as I said. Uh, you know, what happens, I'm... in my experience, is the Navy changes the name of that thing uh, every three or four years, and I just wonder whether this is the latest name that I'm not familiar with. Well, the, the Seafair, as I understood, what they, were, they were primarily talking about building uh, around, uh, I guess it was Lake Michigan. Yeah, it started in North Carolina, then it moved up to Michigan, then Wisconsin, back to Michigan, so on and so on. But is that what you're talking about? Well, the, 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 the uh, Ground Wave Emergency Network, or, or GLAN, as it's referred to, uh, they're talking of, uh, for, I believe they're actually in the process of constructing approximately 20 uh, transmitters in different locations scattered yeah. around the continental United States. Yeah, okay, I understand what it is. Even the terminology changes, but the technology is still the same. Go ahead. Okay. Well, we're going to uh, ha- we're going to have to move on here, Craig. But I thank you for the for the questions. Craig's questions are always rather penetrating. With me is Dr. Andre Puharich. Peter Herkos is on the line. Alan Vaughn is here. You're on Open Mind on Talk Radio 70. Expert of experts, our own Bill Jenkins. There will be food, a chance to meet others who think like you. A presentation by astrologers on the significance of birthdays and a chance to have a curly and photograph taken of the colors of your aura. That's this Tuesday, October 7, in Westwood. The cost is $15.10 for members. Call now for reservations. The number is 818-501-5559. That's 818-501-5559. Kirkos is still here with us, and we have Alan Vaughn in studio. And uh, Ron is on the line. Hello, Ron. Oh, hello, Bill. How's everything going? Oh, not not too bad. Uh, I want to wish a good evening to you and uh, Andrea and Peter and all the guests you have in the studio. So it looks like you're a little crowded there tonight. Oh, it's good to be that way every night. Oh, very good. Uh, I don't know whether Andrea knows uh, of any of the work I've done or not, but... Uh, I'm sorry, could you give me your name again? This is Ron Cole, who's been working Ron a lot Cole. with uh, Tom Bearden. Okay. Uh, we've done... A uh, considerable amount of uh, EOF uh, research on our own and yep. made many chart recordings and so forth. Uh, we don't do this uh, continuously, like uh, round the clock or every day. But coincidentally, to the the uh, several of the missile launches, including the Challenger, we had been recording uh, EOF shock waves simultaneously to that. <laughs> There were other people in the local area. Uh, Mr. Bedini is one, and another colleague of mine also were recording parallel scalar uh, impressions uh, simultaneously to we were recording to the ELF shockwaves. Uh, As Bill mentioned earlier in the program, the 5 hertz signal was very strongly present on all of those three occasions. It's been uh, present practically every time we have seen uh, unusual activity on the sky, such as the formations that Bill also mentioned earlier in in the program. Uh, This we're getting used to. We see it quite often. We've got chart recordings of it and uh, so on and so forth. My question to you, Andrea, is uh, number one is, have you had any uh, background or work done in the theta or beta area, which you're talking about considerably lower than that, 2.5 yes. or yes. 3 hertz as an example. Yes. Uh, I might uh, say that uh, I c- uh, I'm privy to all the information that you are speaking about, and I've you know, heard uh, Tom's public lectures. We've had a lot of private discussions about it, and uh, uh, I'd rather let you talk about it because I, I don't feel that uh, a lot of this stuff should be out, frankly. Uh, it's 
it's, it's pretty frightening when you get the full picture, right? Uh, anyway, about the effects of different frequencies, you mentioned beta and theta, etc. Yes, every frequency uh, in the electroencephalographic spectrum has been explored. And as far as I know, Bob Beck and I were the first people to do this back in 77. And we passed our information on to uh, the heads of government of Great Britain and uh, Canada and the U.S., etc. And that's what started the whole uh, reaction. Because uh, we, I think, pretty conclusively proved what you can do. Bill, I got very little of what Andreas said on this phone. I can barely hear him. I know. we got a problem. I'm trying to talk as loud. I think it's the line. Uh, can you hear me at all? That's a little bit better. Yeah, but... That's a little bit better there. Yeah, somebody may have to repeat what we're saying, unfortunately. But he I... said, he, uh, for Ron's benefit, he was having a hard time hearing you. Yes, that uh, Andrea has uh, checked into those areas. Yes, and did, did that as early as... Uh, 77, and of course, uh, I was working with Tom in those days, two years before that, so we kept abreast of all these developments together. My question to him is, what has a human reaction been to that, uh, those frequencies? Two and, uh, and a half to three hertz, as an example. Yeah. Uh, well, very specifically, 3.21 hertz will cause cancer. If you can cause it, can you remove it? Well, that's, the research is going on. There's some evidence to show that, that whatever function you can switch on in DNA, you can also switch off. And there's a great race now going on all over the world to find out what these various frequencies are. And I hope we can get out of the warfare stage, which is not a happy state to be in, and get into using these things for therapy. Uh, there are reports, and uh, unfortunately most of them are classified, but briefly, uh, certain viruses that are inactive can be turned on to be active in virulent and uh, with one frequency, and once they're in a virulent stage, they can be reversed to a non-virulent stage. That kind of work is going on all over, and there's a lot of data on that. Now, Dr. Reif was doing that kind of work uh, 30, 40 years ago. I really believe that because I'm a great admirer of Reif. observations have been, plus another party which has been doing a very similar thing. Okay. We have noted, and this mainly involves the pattern of driving habits of people on the freeway system here in Southern California. Uh, if, and we've measured both, and uh, either one or the other has been present, if this uh, signal has been measured for two to three hours or even up to four hours, we have noted Mass uh, stupidity, actually, uh, in the driving habits of people on a freeway system. Must be on all the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, it does change. We have, we have observed that. And uh, when it has been present for three to four hours, we observe this. If it's only been present for, say, an hour, hour and a half, it does not occur. And uh, we observe this phenomenon now. Uh, if you want to call it phenomenon, I think it's a reality, if you want me to be honest with you, uh, for almost a year and a half now on measuring ELF uh, measurements. Yeah. In fact, uh, I drive uh, approximately 80 miles of uh, freeway system per day just to commute between uh, my place of work and my home. And every time we measure a strong 3 hertz signal from all the hours prior to me making my commute, uh, I get tangled up with, uh, let's say, uh, the 30 to 40 miles of complete uh, idiots, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. That, uh, That's the way most people put it. <laughs> you know, anyway, or turkeys or whatever you want to call them on the freeway system. And no coherency to their driving patterns uh, whatsoever. When these signals are not present, the whole freeway system is entirely different. Now, this is the reason I, I asked that question. And okay. if we have enough time here, I have another frequency to question you about, which we have measured we, that we do not understand where it's coming from. Okay, basically, are you saying that the uh, 3 hertz signal is coming from outside the vehicle, or is it a function of the electrical system of the uh, vehicle? 
Did you hear that, Ron? No, I did not hear. Well, he wanted to know if you thought that the three hertz signal was a function of the uh, electri- the vehicle itself, the, electri- uh, the electrical system in it, or was it coming from outside? Oh, no. No, no. This is ELF uh, emission. Okay. Uh, so it's not uh, we've, seen, we've seen, uh, say, the cloud patterns being uh, set up on a five hertz or even 7.5 hertz basis many yeah. times. Right. Watch the clouds form, watch the clouds change when the signal disappeared. And then maybe uh, 20 minutes, an hour, half hour later, uh, suddenly we're getting the 5 hertz, uh, the, I'm sorry, the 2.5 or 3 hertz signal at approximately the same intensity. And uh, like I said, if we have this signal for 3 to 4 hours, we notice this mass uh, stupidity in the pattern that the way people drive on the actual freeway mm-hmm. system here in Southern California. Yeah. Okay, Andre? Okay, very briefly... Uh, there's several factors at work here. One is, I'm sure you've probably heard Bob Beck's lecture about the scalar wave experiments done out of Los Alamos, which caused a lot of damage in Southern California. So our own people are doing, I mean, that he gave as a public lecture. Uh, our own people are doing experiments, uh, basically, as you know, trying to catch up with the Soviets. Number two, there's been West Coast bombardment by the Soviet Union for the last uh, eight or nine years. And I don't know whether that's part of the equation. I don't know exactly what you're doing to triangulate the uh, uh, source of the signal. Are you trying to triangulate it all and locate it? Are you trying to locate the source of the signal, Ron? Um, I'm pretty sure that's the source of the signal. That isn't the problem. The uh, thing is, when it's present, we get this result, and it's been pretty well confirmed by myself and one other party. Mm -hmm. Now, I I will go a little farther. We did some research and got into the computer at the City of Hope in Duarte, California here, which has uh, computer data on every physiological or medical phenomenon known to man. And there is nothing in that computer, data-wise, in this range of the frequency spectrum. And it kind of interests me because uh, uh, it seems like everything kind of chops off below about six hertz and Uh that's another question why is this why isn't anyone studying frequencies lower than that Uh, well there are classified projects looking at the frequencies if you look at the uh, astronomical literature they're studying uh, waves coming out of the sun at a thousand one thousandth of a hertz so studies are going on way down in the spectrum from natural recorded ELF stuff coming out of the sun. And there's a big literature on that, incidentally. Well, I was referring to medical data and, and psychological. Uh, uh, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's pretty much classified. You're not going to get anybody to do it in the open literature that I know. The fact is, I'm setting up a, a program to look at that very sort of thing in a foreign country because I can't do it in the United States. Does that help you run? Uh, I only got about uh, 25% of that this level so low I can really... Well, he said it. it's very difficult to do it here to get any information because the work being done is basically classified. And, you know, they classify everything in the United States, and he's taking his studies outside the United States where it can be done. That is the same conclusion I've come up with. It, it seems like once you get uh, in the theta or beta range, uh, yeah. that's a no-no. You're not supposed to talk about it. Absolutely. You're not supposed to detect it or anything else. Yeah. So listen, when I get out to California, let's get together and have a heart-to-heart about the nitty-gritty. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll, I, I'll get you two together. Okay, I copy thanks. that, and that's a real yeah, good great idea. Great talking to you. I've okay. Got, Bill, I've got one other question to, to ask him. Okay. Uh, on numerous occasions, one time, which Tom Bearden mentioned in his book, by the way, we had a unique power outage here. And we measured a frequency which is almost synchronous with the uh, television frame rate. Uh 29.7 hertz. Now, I've measured that frequency twice. When it appears, it is intense. It is a magnitude of 100 times greater than any of the uh, Soviet ELF uh, signals uh, that are present. Do you have any idea what this 29.7 hertz signal is? And it's definitely a ground wave. Well, in that frequency range, I'm not going to give the exact frequency over the air, but... There's a frequency right near there which is very destructive of human behavior because it pulls 
calcium out of every cell in the body, whether it's brain cells or bone cells or whatever. And the great expert on that in your part of the country is W. Ross Addy at the Veterans Hospital in Loma Linda. And he has published stuff going back, uh, I would say, to about 1977 or 78 on that. Half a dozen papers, so I will look that up. You, you know who W. Ross Addy is, don't you? You know W. Ross Addy, Ron? Uh, no, I don't. He's at Loma Linda Veterans Hospital, okay? Yeah, the, it, in that uh, near range, I'm, Ron, in case you missed part of that, it has a way of pulling the calcium out of the cells. I see. Okay. Which uh, is one of the most deadly frequencies we know. The thing that was uh, mentioned earlier was the submarine communications. They have 85 miles of uh, antenna grid in the Great Lakes, you know. Yeah. And they're putting out, well, they have more than one frequency, but the frequency is most common is 67 hertz. Now, yeah, they, they call that ELF. That is not ELF. Uh, it's higher than that, but that's what the Navy calls it. Yeah. Now, anybody that would like to detect that signal, all i got to do is to hook onto a water pipe or stick a ground rod in the earth and hook it to a, uh, just a high-gain op-amp and drive it into a oscilloscope. And, uh, there you are. There's a little more to it than that, actually. You need a, uh, a notch filter to cancel out 60 hertz because that's all around it. Yeah. But uh, you can read the uh, very slow serial code. Yeah. That, uh, with the longs and the shorts and everything else that they're putting out. It takes about 20 minutes to send one simple sentence around the world because of the uh, of the frequency that's involved. But uh, anyway, we've uh, seen this in Bedini's lab. I've seen it here. Anyone that puts a little bit of application ahead of us, uh, any kind of decent oscilloscope, can see the uh, 67 hertz that's being uh, t transmitted from the, uh, the, the Great Lakes for submarine communications worldwide. Okay, Ron. Okay, uh, great talking to you, Ron. And we'll get you two together when uh, Andrea gets here. That sounds great, Bill. That. All right, thank you. Sure appreciate being on the show tonight. It's my pleasure, Ron. Oh, okay, It's Bill. always fascinating talking to these minds, and these minds are telling us that there is another kind of war going on that makes the atomic bomb look like a little firecracker. And, and Peter Herkos, are you still there, Peter? Yeah, Bill, yeah. listen. Mm -hmm. I hope you will come the 18 in Marriott Hotel by the airport, 10.30 to 5 o'clock. I'm going to demonstrate. I take any test that scientists may impose. Are uh, you going to be there? Dr. Yes, uh, will oh, be there? yes. I'm going to take about 30, 40 people. All right. Fantastic. And you're going to be on uh, open mind here in a couple of weeks. We'll work that out this week as to just when. Yeah. And, and I sure uh, like to be in your show and prove something to people in this world. All right, you're going to get a chance, and I'm looking forward to that. We have Alan Vaughn in the studio with us, and we have uh, Eric on the line. Hello, Eric. Hello. In addition to providing a lot of uh, very useful information, I'd like to say that your show also helps us improve the virtue of patience. <laughs> By sitting there forever, right? Precisely. You know, you know, so I'll send you my ear doctor's bill after he straightens up my cartilage. <laughs> I'm sorry, Eric. There's nothing else. There's nothing we can do. Well, we can't bid space time in here. I know right? what you mean. Um, I was calling about something that was mentioned some time ago uh, in terms of, of this particular show, uh, and that was the water that was um, given uh, special properties by healers. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there was any information available as to how that water was used. Was it used, for example, in bath water was used, was used in sort of like anointing, was used for drinking, uh, or what, that, what kind of uses were made of it? Okay, Eric, uh, let me just say a few things. First, I'm going to speak uh, extensively on that subject at the seminar, and if you can't make it, there will be a series of tapes. Mm -hmm. available, which will go into all the lab detail and so on. But essentially, what is used is ordinary tap water. You don't have to have any special kind of water. Mm -hmm. The healer puts his hands around the water bottle, and it has to be of glass, silicon glass, not plastic. Plastic somehow absorbs the uh, energy, and it doesn't get through the water. Mm -hmm. And the uh, water has to be drunk once it's treated by the healer, in very small amounts, something like a teaspoonful a day, if you uh, drink uh, a glass full of it, you just, uh, it's a super relax and you just go to sleep. <laughs> don't don't take a lot of this stuff and get in the car and drive. It's really bad for 
for putting you to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other properties which I don't want to go into, but uh, as I say, you can uh, pick all that up from the tape if you can't make it to the seminar. All uh, right, how have we got the tape? Oh, uh, you call up uh, here we go, 213-393-9405. You got that? Mm hmm Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Eric. Goodbye. Okay, let me see. We have Jan, who's been waiting patiently on the line all night long. Jan? Hi. Hi. How's your ear? <laughs> Pretty good, thank you. All right. I'm concerned about various types of radiation from household appliances, my home computer, television, and things like that. And I was wondering what I can do about it, and in particular, whether the 8 hertz generator would be effective in neutralizing or reducing such radiation. Okay, basically... Uh I'm glad you brought this question up because I haven't touched upon it. We've only talked about warfare. But what happened is that a number of us developed ultra-sensitive e equipment, which is not available on the market, so we can run around and measure all kinds of ELF radiation. And that's really the bad stuff because it acts on the DNA. And we found out, for example, that every television sta uh, uh, set or video display tunnel puts out about 9.4 hertz which is not good for your health without going into all the details. Uh, every appliance in your home, whether it's a refrigerator, an air conditioner, and, and there isn't one that's ex exempt from this, will put out some frequency of ELF. Nobody planned it. It just happened in the construction and design of the equipment. Some of the equipment has been around for years. Nobody ever measured it before until we had this ultra-sensitive equipment to measure these very, very weak magnetic fields. Uh, and, and that goes, uh, you know, on for a long time, uh, all the things that cause it. Uh, cars are very, uh, automobiles are a very bad source of ELF radiation. A lot of people go to sleep at the driver's wheel just because of the frequency of the ELF put out by the motor and the spark and so on. We have found in our research over a number of years that the watch that I'm speaking about does protect you against these fields but you have to wear 24 hours a day because you build up a field on your body uh, with time. And the longer you wear it, the bigger the field and the more protection you get. Usually it takes three to four days to build up a field adequate for heavy-duty protection. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Jan, there's one thing yeah. that you might, uh, what we've been experimenting with over at, <laughs> at my home, which seems to be some sort of an experimental place a lot. <laughs> But uh, we have taken just a common, ordinary quartz crystal yeah. and uh, uh, strapped that to the AC inlet to the refrigerators, the television sets, the computers, and things like that that are over there and have seen a dramatic reduction in the ELF. That yeah, that, that occurs. And incidentally, you probably know this, Bill, but if you take the crystal in your hand and what we call program it, that is kind of talk to it, your hand puts out almost in most people, 8 hertz signal, and it will remember that signal, and that's what protects you against the uh, effects of the ELF. Okay. Wow. See? Yes, where can I get a crystal like that, or is it just any yeah, crystal? Can. Oh, you can get them at Alexandria, too, is a good place. Uh, Heidi Hill Enterprise, what part of town you live in? West L.A. Oh, uh, Bodhi Tree. They okay. Would, they would have them for you down there. That's close. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Bye. I'm Bill Jenkins. It's Open Mind on a Saturday night on K. Bob, on the line. Hello, Bill. I'd like to ask a question about uh, the polar shift that I, I hear so much about that, that's coming. Uh, does this ELF transmission, Does it? will it have some effect on the, the polarity of the planet? Are you asking me the question? Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we don't know. Let me explain a little bit of the background of what we do know. Uh, Nikola Tesla first discovered that ELF radiation sent through the Earth can cause shifts in the plates, can cause earthquakes, etc. The Soviets in 1976 particularly were experimenting with the effect of the ELF on earthquakes. And we have good evidence uh, which leads me to believe that the Soviet experiments with ELF waves caused the greatest earthquake of this century, the Tangshan earthquake in China in August of 76. And uh, the, exper the experimenters were uh, just shocked by the effects, uh, as we hear from the underground out of Russia, 
and they uh, quit doing this because they didn't know what would happen. And uh, Tom Bearden and his colleagues believe, from their calculations, that if somebody uses ELF or scalar waves really more precisely, indiscriminately on the Earth, you can set up a resonance between the Earth and the Sun, that which could probably. cause something like a polar shift. So this is a real hazard, and this is one of the reasons we ought to stop playing with these gigantic uh, weapons that uh, can disturb natural forces. That's all we need to do is start resonating the Earth and Sun. Yeah, I mean, that's it, you know. That's perfect. May I suggest that uh, the Great Siberian Mystery, uh, that Great Siberian si explosion early on in this, in this century was uh, Tesla testing one of his uh, scalar technologies? You know, I can well believe that because Tesla was very active during that period, 1908. Uh, you know, he had the Long Island transmitter going. He'd done experiments in Colorado Springs, etc. And it would be interesting to nail that down from, you know, somebody who was a, a witness like, uh, well some of the people we know who worked with them. Well, I've read the accounts of the people that were close by, and they said it was a strange light that came out from one direction, and when it landed, it, it sent a shock wave out, and, and where it landed, it blew all the trees out in a uh, perfect circle right. in every direction, and people felt it from miles away, were thrown dozens of feet, and windows broke and everything, and, and it left a sort of saturated uh, energy in the air, almost like a, a radioactive, but it wasn't quite the same thing. Well, I can well believe it, and I don't want to go into details, but some of these things are pretty hairy and scary. Yeah. There's some modern, recent evidence that uh, somebody's playing that game on this planet. Well, that's all that's too bad. <laughs> Yes, the, uh, we see a lot of evidence of that, Bob. Very uh, very perceptive of you. Unfortunately. Well, enjoy your show, and uh, thanks for all you're doing. I all appreciate right. it. Well, Thank you for being bored. Bye-bye. Yeah, all right, Craig, you're on. Hi. Hello. Yes, hello. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, you have a wonderful show, Bill. I really enjoy it. Thank you. And I have uh, two questions, uh, one for Dr. Buharich mm -hmm. and one for Peter Herkos. Okay. Uh, my first question is, I, I joined the program late. I missed the first hour, so maybe you've already said this. But Shame on you. Yeah. Um, is there any uh, available literature in a standard college library that one could go and look up and get some basic information on the DLS phenomenon? Has Dr. Baharaj, for example, written a book or an article or something? Well, let me answer your question. Is this the same Craig we talked to before? No, this is a different No, this is a different Oh, okay. Uh, basically, uh, I wrote a book about this seven years ago under contract with my publisher, the major publisher whom I've had for years, and the book has been censored for seven years by the FBI. That's a fact, okay? No joke. No. Number two, uh, we have been able to establish a an organization outside the United States in Canada, which is called the Planetary Association for Clean Energy, or PACE, the Latin ablative form for peace, pace. And uh, we uh, recently generated a database of some 1,500 items culled from the world liter literature on ELF. And let me quickly give you the address of where to write. Okay. It's, as I say, PACE. The address is 100 Bronson, B-R-O-N-S-O-N Street, and uh, it's in Ottawa, Canada. I don't have the zip code off the top of my head, but you can call up Ottawa and get the zip for that area, okay? Okay. And you get all the literature you want. Yep, there's a lot of it there. What exactly does ELF stand for? Uh, extremely low frequency and very specifically magnetic waves. Not electromagnetic waves. I see. All right, okay. your question for Peter, real quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Herkos, um, many people in Southern California have been getting the message uh, that in 1987, in the first half of 1987, there will be a major earthquake. Can you confirm that? Hello, hello, yes. hello, hello. Yes, uh, Peter, he wanted to know if you could confirm if there was going to be a major earthquake in early 1987. There's going to be a tremendous earthquake. Nobody knows exactly when, but it will be very close, and better people has uh, flashlights and food around it. Want to go to be the civil defense going in there, and you are going to check. The stores will be damaged. I hope I was wrong, but I have seen it very clearly. But nobody knows the date uh, yet. But, but I would say October, November. 
What, next year? Uh, this year. This year? 1986. 19, uh, in other words... Very close, yes. Very close. I can miss maybe about two weeks or three weeks, but in that area. All right, so you say we're in for it, huh, Peter? Yes. Okay. Listen, our time is up, Craig. Thank, thank you for that thank call. Very much. And Peter, thanks a lot for telling Bill, us that. Bill, I sure like to be on your show and prove something. All right, you're going to be on in a couple of weeks. I'll get with you Monday, and uh, we'll see you and Andrea out at the airport Marriott Hotel. Alan Vaughn, thank you for dropping in, and Andrea Paharic, looking forward to you coming to town. It'll be grand to be with you again. And I'll see you next week. Next week, we'll have Nick Nasserino on. We'll be talking about that crystal skull and many other things. So you join us then for Open Mind next week. <laughs>